Hello and welcome to Dialogue. It's been a busy year for China's space program as it made great leaps in lunar exploration and construction of its space station. And more is likely to come before this year's end. So what else is part of China's space program? And will space become the new frontier of geopolitical competing or even rivalry? To review China's efforts this year in space and get a glimpse of what may still come in the future, I'm glad to be joined today by Professor Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy at Beijing Normal University, Professor Ulrich Walter from the Institute of Astronautics at the Technical University of Munich, and also Professor Bernard Foeng, Director of the International Lunar Exploration Working Group Euro Moon Mars Earth Space Innovation. And that is our topic. I'm Li Qiuyuan. All right, gentlemen, let's talk about this. Why don't I start with you, Professor Zhang? Now, last month, three Chinese astronauts returned in the Shenzhou 12 return capsule after 90 days aboard the Tiangong Space Station, still under construction. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about their three-month mission there aboard the Tiangong Station? What have they accomplished? How have they set the stage for the next missions? And how important are they? Right, so their task was basically part of the commissioning of the uh, Tianhe-1 so test module. It's not actually uh, the official uh, core module for the space station yet. It's, uh, it has a sibling. It has a prototype, another prototype on the ground, um, ready to undergo corrective surgeries if the current one in orbit um, fail to deliver on any aspects. Uh, and the astronauts are actually there to test out all the core technologies related to this, to this test module. Uh, for example, very importantly, they're, they're testing the uh, regenerative life support system. So in the past, the Chinese manned missions tend to be short-timed, uh, meaning that you can just bring oxygen in a bottle with you. And this time, obviously, three months long, you, you can't do that anymore. So that's one important test. Another test is they, uh, they did spacewalks with the uh, robotic arm, and those are, are, are much more sophisticated actual task accomplishing uh, spacewalks very different from before once again. So, so all in all, uh, they, their tasks, they, they, the Tianhe one core module basically passed all the, uh, all the tests um, assigned this time uh, with flying colors. So in all likelihood, I think if, if nothing goes wrong for the next mission, the next crew mission will also do additional commissioning tasks, but that will be the last of the commissioning hmm. uh, flight. Right. That re uh, yeah, actually, that yeah. regenerative life support system is so crucial, right? Especially for a long durational stay. Next mission will they will be staying there for six months, so that's uh, especially important. And Professor Walter, let me bring you into this. You're a former astro uh, astronaut yourself. You've actually spent time in space. How are you looking at the Shenzhou 12 mission that's just been completed? How was it different from the mission you were on? Well, in those days, I flew in the shuttle mission. We didn't have an international space station in those days. I flew in 1993. So in, in a, I would say we had a laboratory on the space shuttle, which is exactly the same as that on the International Space Station. So consider our mission as a kind of precursor to the International Space Station we have now. But the experience is more or less the same. It's experience of weightlessness. It's to experience that it's quite hard to work in weightlessness because things have to be done differently than on ground. This is the reason why we need so much training on ground. And I'm convinced that the training for spacewalks, for example, are the same in the Western and Eastern world like in China. So we need a lot of experience of training on ground to do spacewalks. Uh, both on the International Space Station on the, and the Chinese Space Station. Hmm. And as we speak, Professor Zhang, China is getting ready to launch its Shenzhou 13 mission. That is scheduled uh, to happen in mid-October. And we are sending another three astronauts who are going to spend uh, six months in space. And that's going to include perhaps one female astronaut. That has generated a lot of excitement in China. Tell us more about that mission, Professor Zhang. Also, what are the next steps for China's space program? Right, so six months would be the more regular sort of duration for a for 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 for, for a trip to um, to the station, and obviously having a, a female astronaut um, is they're testing out the uh, well the endurance of the uh, of the female astronaut living with two blokes, 
the task in particular uh, will be to test out additional sort of commissioning task to test out the ability of Tiangong, Tianhe One to, to connect with two additional lab modules that will be launched later on and, and, and connect with it. Uh, for example, you have the, um, the crew module sort of docking with the uh, Tiangong station, uh, Tianhe module from the side. Obviously, um, if you imagine the, uh, the space station is like a stick, you're hitting it on both ends, then it's not gonna tumble. But if you hit it from the side, then it's likely to tumble. So that's a more difficult task, but you have to do that to leave enough number of docking spots for the, uh, for the crew capsules in the future. Uh, and they, they will also do some transposi transpositioning uh, tests uh, to allow future sort of lab module when it's attached on the end to be moved to the side. That's sort of a, Aim, that sort of ta tests aiming at uh, future construction work more rather than testing the Tiangong, Tianhe one itself, like the, the last crew. So that's the main difference. Hmm. And Professor Walter, you've actually met with some of the Chinese astronauts yourself, right? You've met with Yang Liwei, the first Chinese astronaut ever been to space. You've also met with Wang Yaping, one of the two female astronauts that have ever been to space. And she might just be a candidate for the next mission, the Shenzhou 13 mission as a veteran astronaut. Uh, how are they like in person? And what do you think are the most important qualities that China sees as in one of their astronauts? And how is it different from, let's say, the trainings you get with the German team or NASA? Well, first of, uh, first of all, you should know that we have a so-called ASE, an national, uh, International um, Association of Space Explorers. That means all the flown astronauts meet once a year uh, somewhere on, uh, on Earth this time or this year. It will be in November in Hungary, in uh, Budapest. So we meet there. Usually we have about 100 to 150 people flown, astronauts and cosmonauts. And uh, yes, that's right. I met also the Chinese astronauts there, the cosmonauts and the uh, Chinese cosmonauts. Actually, it was my impression there is no difference between <laughs> any nation who flies into space. I mean, the astronauts who flies into space, uh, they are all nice guys. When we have problems in spaceflight, it's usually between the nations, between politics, not between spaceflight itself and the astronauts. So I can tell you, training is more or less the same. People are the same, that is the astronauts. There's no problem between astronauts. It's nice to hear. It sounded like you guys are from a big family there. Um, very good atmosphere, That's actually. True. That's true. We are, this is true. We are a big family, and we are proud of that. Cool. And Professor Foeing, the Shenzhou 13 mission, as we mentioned, it's going to be a six-month long duration. What do you see as the most challenging part for such a mission? Yeah, uh, so the challenge is, of course, is that uh, um, the system uh, for launch and return work well, and also for uh, staying. Uh, but uh, it uh, would be a, a good uh, challenge uh, to uh, um, learn how to uh, live and work in space for this uh, long duration and for this uh, there is a number of supply and also of uh, method and uh, discipline that uh, astronaut and also the ground support team and because also we, we have a free astronaut, uh, astronaut but uh, they are supported by a large uh, group on ground and they are also supported by the whole uh, nation as i see even the whole world and so uh, and i'm looking forward also uh, to start this series of uh, scientific and uh, technology experiments you know where we are going to gain uh, new knowledge we are going to learn uh, lessons uh, uh, in uh, operations but also in uh, the behavior of a sort of space uh, we'll, uh, on the physiology on the uh, uh, living space and this will be uh, very useful uh, as well as a preparation for future deep space exploration like uh, toward the moon and, and beyond hmm. so and uh, uh, this uh, task of uh, assembling uh, modules uh, in space, that's also a key uh, for uh, future uh, larger structures uh, and uh, constructions uh, for uh, the build up of uh, the, the Tiangong uh, Space Station. The next year, we are going to add some additional uh, modules, uh, you know, some experiment modules, uh, like Wentian, Mengtian, uh, the quest for Evan or the dreaming of Evan, it will be attached on the side of the core module. And even, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in the future, we are planning to have an additional uh, module uh, called Xuntian, mm. 
that will be a large telescope that will be then detached and work a bit like the Hubble Space Telescope and do beautiful uh, uh, astronomical science. Yeah, it's going to be a multi-module complex, right? Professor John, talk to us about are we on schedule uh, to finish the construction of the Tiangong Space Station in space? I mean, we are expecting it to be finished by the end of 2022, and we've got, what, 11 missions to finish that. We are probably on our fourth mission. Is everything on schedule? And when it's completed, how does it compare in scale with the International Space Station? Right, so we're definitely on schedule. So the uh, construction phase, once, once the commissioning is done, uh, the construction phase is supposed to start next springtime. And then the uh, two lab modules, once those are attached, uh, the, the, the station will reach something like 90 tons, depending on how many other crew and uh, the cargo ships are also attached. Um, but in all likelihood, uh, there's actually gonna be a expansion phase um, because uh, as I said, there is a backup module, backup core module on the ground and uh, why waste that, right? Just to launch it again and, and, and make it a, an extension. And by that time with the extension, you're gonna have half of the size of the, uh, half of the weight of the International Space Station. Um, but that, that weight consideration alone is a little misleading because this is a new station. So a lot of new technology goes into it. For example, it's the solar panels are a lot lighter. You don't need heavy structure to, to hold it up. Um, so in terms of experimental capacities, once the uh, expansion phase is in, you're going to have something oh. around 46 standardized sort of um, cabin for, for scientific ex experiments compared to 31 for the International Space Station. So it's smaller, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty ca capable. And will China's space station, Professor Zhang again, be opening to foreign astronauts? Will we be seeing you know, foreign astronauts on board China's space station anytime soon, working along with China's astronauts? What do you think? Right, um, so, so collaboration is definitely already open, it's ongoing, um, but that currently is in the form of uh, experiments being carried out there, designed by, by foreign collaborators and then um, operated by Chinese astronauts at the moment. Um, but in the future, uh, as, as um, the other two uh, guests mentioned, the uh, European uh, astronauts have, have came to China and trained with the Chinese astronauts. And apparently they're learning Chinese. I don't know how, how far they went. Uh, <laughs> Is it true, right. Professor, right. Professor Fowen? Are they learning Chinese? Is working on China Space Station something that they are interested in? Yes, so we have a number of uh, uh, astronauts, including uh, uh, Samantha Kisoforiti. So she went uh, to some uh, training session in China. Um, also, we have had some uh, uh, take or not uh, candidates that train together with uh, our European astronauts, for instance, for some uh, analog uh, research uh, work. You know, like I see in your background, uh, we have uh, some, uh, we use some volcanoes so here in Hawaii, but also in, uh, in the, the Canarias, in uh, uh, Lanzarote, to train astronauts uh, to tasks that they will perform in the future on the moon, but also in some of these uh, uh, extreme uh, situations that uh, they can encounter during the space flight. And uh, we did that together with uh, between European uh, Chinese astronauts and, and also worldwide astronauts. And uh, we are also uh, teaching the astronauts uh, to perform a scientific experiment that uh, they could uh, uh, conduct uh, on uh, the Chinese uh, space station. And uh, as you know, also uh, China has conducted some bilateral uh, discussion with countries like France, Italy, and other countries uh, to, the, to host some uh, scientific experiments in in basic physics, in space medicine, in, mm. even in space astronomy. And even China has uh, uh, signed an agreement with the uh, uh, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs uh, to invite all UN member states to participate in some uh, cooperative experimental project. Mm. And uh, nine projects from 17 countries have been uh, selected. So in astrophysics, microgravity, uh, biology, uh, Earth observation. And uh, so this will uh, uh, have very nice uh, international science technology flavor uh, on uh, Tiangong. And uh, we hope that at some stage, we will have also some uh, uh, European astronauts uh, that will uh, uh, do some their work there together with the Chinese astronauts. And Professor Walter, just what kind of role does the European Space Agency sees 
China Space Station play. I mean, what kind of areas do you see cooperation as the most beneficial and most effective? Well, let me first say that traditionally we had cooperated with the United States. This is true. However, uh, the world should understand that Europe uh, is open to any kind of cooperation with the Russians, with Chinese. This is the reason why our astronauts, the ESA astronauts, the European astronauts, already trained in China for the Chinese station. And we will open to continue that. So people should see, yes, we're interested to cooperate on the Chinese space station. Um, and answering your question, I think technology is very important. Also, United States always said technology is very important. So cooperation with China in technology, space technology, for example, robotics on the, uh, on the uh, space station is very important. Uh, look at me, for my example, we're doing robotics in space. This is our technology we're developing. We use that currently in order for the elderly people here on ground to help them to be self-sufficient in their homes. So this is a spin-off of space technology and ground, and I think this would be also very interesting for the Chinese people. So technology, I think, is the most important, but science, of course, is also important for all nations on the world. All right, there's more to talk about, but let's now take a short break on the dialogue. Stay with us, gentlemen. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Professor Boeing, let me start with you this time. Let's talk about this uh, competition between China and U.S. How do you foresee the future development of a China space program in regards to the competition and uh, cooperation China might have with the United States? Uh, yeah, uh, clearly uh, uh, we have a, a competition, uh, economical rivalry, and also uh, yeah, some uh, uh, military uh, rivalry. Uh, this is uh, very much also enhanced uh, sometimes by uh, internal uh, politics, as you could see in the in the U.S. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, that creates a, a kind of a competitive uh, spirit that uh, uh, forces the U.S. to put uh, their act uh, together. Uh, on the other hand, uh, now, um, when you are on a ship, you need really to have all the things in order. You need a captain, you need to have order. And so if you dock on the ship, everything has to be uh, safe. And uh, in that sense, uh, so International Space Station uh, from the, uh, was very restrictive. And uh, the European Space Agency actually proposed that China should be allowed to join the International Space Station, but the U.S. Uh, refused. Now, uh, China has uh, uh, their own uh, uh, space station, which is uh, very open to the world. So we are looking forward to show that uh, this scheme is a, is a great, it's a way to go for the future. When we go to the moon, the moon is a continent. And from there, you uh, can have various bases uh, working um, uh, separately but then we'll find ways to work together on the surface of the moon continent. Yeah, we always welcome some healthy competitions, just as in the Olympics, right? But the U.S. Senator Jerry Morin said, I'm quoting his words, the U.S. Congress will be very supportive of additional funding for space and national defense, saying that the United States astronauts, when returning to moon, do not want to be welcomed by Chinese and Russians. Uh, so, so, Professor Walter, let me bring you into this. Let me get your reaction on what's been said there. Do you think that the moon and space will soon become the next frontier for geopolitical rivalry? Well, I don't would say rivalry. It's, let me summarize what my colleague Foyne said. There won't be any cooperation between the United States and China. Uh, <laughs> they will have competition. And you know what? This is very good. Because competition means to do the best, to attempt the best. So this, and the United States likes competition. And China should also like competition. So I'm looking forward for the competition, going to the moon, going to Mars, because this means we do it earlier than without competition. So I'm looking forward to see who would be first on the moon and would be first on the Mars. I'm looking forward for that. And this is all good for all nations on the world. Oh, wow. Professor John, let me get your thoughts here. Uh, will we never see cooperation between China and the United States? What do you think? Only competitions? 
Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so in the past, I mean, ever since 2011, the U.S. Congress passed law um, prohibits uh, NASA from working with China. At that time, it's more sort of uh, uh, we can learn nothing from the Chinese and uh, we sort of white or we giving them an edge uh, by teaching them how to do things, that kind of a mentality. Nowadays, it's changed to something else. Uh, for example, just yesterday, the Commerce Secretary uh, openly said, you know, uh, they, they, they want to slow down Chinese innovation and by, uh, by sort of uh, collaborating with Europeans is the best, best way to isolate China, so to cut, out, cut it off from global innovation chain. Um, so, uh, so while competition is good, um, competition by doing better than the other is good. Competition by trying to sabotage each other is probably not as good. Um, but in any case, um, the, the added pressure historically had uh, propelled Chinese um, space industry to basically do its own thing. And currently on some specialty issues, uh, it is actually doing quite well, even better than the US, I, I might even say. Um, and so it's not necessarily a bad thing if you have a, a very dominant uh, competitor. Um, well, actually, if you look at some US allies, um, national champions in some industries that got took, taken over by their US competitors, they sort of just wither away. Um, so having a firewall in between you and the dominant player is not always necessarily a bad thing. So, so yeah, I, I don't think collaboration is likely, but I don't think that's a bad thing either. How about China's Lee, may I add something? Me, saying competition doesn't mean that the scientists and engineers doesn't talk to, don't talk to each other. There are many international conferences where the engineers and scientists meet and they exchange knowledge. Mm -hmm. They exchange what they know. And on this level, we will have a cooperation, but not on the nation level, you know? Mm -hmm. So competition is good for the science and technology. Mm -hmm. And this is why I welcome this competition. They're encouraging words. Now, also talk yeah. to us, Professor John, about China's moon program, right? Last year, we've successfully had a Chang'e 5 probe completing its mission, collecting the soil sample from the moon. What's next for China's moon mission? Is sending a, mo is sending a man some moon uh, something on the timetable for China? Right, um, sometime uh, in the far future. So, yeah. Um, it's a lot less ambitious than the U.S. Uh, Artemis um, mission, I think their plan was for 2024. I don't really see how that's happening, but regardless, that's, a, that's, that's their plan. Um, the Chinese plan is actually announced jointly with the Russians uh, because uh, the two countries are, are trying to build a joint uh, international research space on the moon. And the plan is for something around 2036. Um, so given how the super heavy rockets are developing in China, I think that's a, that's a realistic, if, if not conservative, timeline. Um, for the immediate future, though, um, the next mission will be similar to the last one, which is a sample collection mission. Um, but the, uh, the probe will go to the back of the moon uh, near the South Pole. So there are... No? No, no, to the, to the pole, mostly, or possibly the South Pole that can be seen. But uh, yes, it will, uh, it's, a, it's a mission that is, uh, will take uh, the technology of the uh, landing and sample return, and uh, it will uh, go to the polar regions, and uh, uh, from there return uh, uh, some samples. And actually there are uh, contributions also from uh, the French uh, space agencies. They will have uh, some experiment uh, on, on, uh, on board uh, to measure the volatiles and the uh, record it. Actually, I have been myself uh, they involved in uh, this uh, Chang'e mission because, as you know, at the beginning of the millennium, we had the first mission, ESA, smart one, that was the father of this mission. And after we discussed uh, with our Chinese uh, friends some collaboration where we uh, contributed uh, from ESA to Chang'e 1, 2, 3 uh, to give some uh, ground station support for those. And uh, we uh, then also uh, opened the way for really international collaboration in the lunar uh, mission. But in since that time, China has uh, launched more than uh, seven different uh, probes to the moon. So you can say that really they are dominating uh, uh, the uh, robotic exploration. And when they are going to put together 
But this expertise of going to the moon and uh, in an automatic way, and the expertise they put in human space flight for the Tiangong program, you can say a very high level of maturity for the uh, next phase at the frontier to be able to have an uh, orbital station around the moon and then on the surface. And uh, it's great to see this uh, mission implemented step by step and construct, contributing to overall construction of uh, expertise uh, uh, science that is shared with the world, but also a more complex operation uh, with human, and to see how this is contributing. Um, for instance, for the moon, you know, it's uh, you talk about geopolitical rivalry. The moon is a great, great place for peace. You know, we have an outer space treaty that uh, prevents uh, to have a, a territorial claim by countries. We cannot militarize the moon. Uh, there is a, even uh, argument on rescue of, of astronauts. Uh, so uh, we will use the moon as a great uh, uh, continent for uh, peaceful uh, innovation, science. And uh, I see that uh, China is taking a very big role into that. And we'll see how uh, we can uh, use also this uh, competition, Olympic competitions uh, between the different countries and cooperation uh, to have a really a, a a program of uh, exploration that will benefit everybody on Earth. Now, That's Professor also the Bowen. meaning of our vision of a, a global moon village where everybody can find benefits. Yes. Mm -hmm. Professor Bowen, you mentioned the moon is the space for peaceful cooperation. I also uh, want to get your take on Russia's moon exploration program since you're an expert on lunar exploration yes. missions. After a 45-year break, Russia will now pick up its lunar program through its Luna 25 mission. And the lander is designed to study ice below the moon's surface, which future would-be explorers would want to tap into as a possible resource. And will also to evaluate the dangers posed by sharp fragments of lunar dust. How do you assess Russia's achievements in lunar exploration and study? Does it mark yet another round of the space race? Yes, clearly Russia and uh, also the Soviet Union uh, past achievements have been tremendous and they have done uh, a series of firsts, uh, not only uh, Sputnik, Gagarin, but also the first mission to fly uh, by the moon and then, uh, uh, then uh, they developed a number of missions up to Luna 24, including uh, three uh, automatic sample returns uh, from, uh, from the moon. And of course, there was a big uh, pause, but they had other uh, 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 activities in space, but also for their country. And now, after this parenthesis, we have the next Luna mission, Luna 25. So this will uh, land uh, in a high uh, latitude site, so the near polar region, not exactly the pole, but near polar region. After in Luna, uh, this, uh, there will be a Luna uh, 26 that will be an orbiter. And then Luna 27 is a very ambitious mission at the very uh, near the, the south pole of the moon, where we have found some uh, deposit of uh, water ice in some areas. And so if you went in some uh, of this water ice uh, uh, regions, but still with some uh, sunlight, and uh, there in collaboration with uh, the European Space Agency that is delivering uh, some uh, system to drill in the depths uh, uh, to see what is the distribution of this ice uh, with depths, and we'll measure also some of the property of the, this uh, uh, material there. And then uh, Russia has also some future plans for sample return, and as we, uh, we have mentioned, there is a possibility of an international lunar research session that uh, they are discussing with China. So yes, uh, Russia is uh, back into the area of uh, lunar exploration. Wow, fascinating as exploring space is one shared goal for the mankind, right? Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for this edition of Dialogue. Appreciate your insight, Professor John Fun, Professor Ulrich Walter, and Professor Bernard Foeing joining us live there via, via Zoom. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Dialogue. Thank you so much for your time. And bye for now.